vaid see, et hematoloogia võib meil anda palju, et me peaksime püüdma interpreteerida seda, mida me leia. So the cats presented with a clinical history of pruritus. When it presented, it was initially very depressed. Ja kassil on alame siis sügelus ja hetkel, kui ta tuli kliinikusse, oli ta väga loim. So if we're thinking about a patient that's depressed, which leukogram pattern are we expecting? Aga loim looma on missugust leukogram, me võiksime eeldada. So we're already expecting what the Americans would call a stress leukogram. But what Graham would call a glucocorticoid leukogram. However, the cat became extremely excited during blood collection and it bit the nurse that was trying to get the sample. Põrekoolu võtmise käegus kassik ei ole väga, väga erutus ja ammustas õde, kes seda abilist, kes seda võrdses võttis. So what leukogram pattern might lead that to, might lead us to expect? Ja mis suht leukogramime siis selle jääl võiksime oodata? Epinefrin leukogram. Epinefrin, or as our American colleagues would call it, the excitement leukogram. Ja, eks siis epinefrin leukogram. So when you see a report such as that, there are so many parameters that it can be overwhelming. So I like to break it into paragraphs, and so I just look at small parts and then try to put the whole picture together. Ta tahaks teha selle suure pildi nagu väiksemateks osadeks, et see infopult ei oleks nii suur. So let us start with the red cell parameters and we ask ourselves the question, is this patient anemic or not? Siin on siis pilt, mis räägib punastest vereljuledest, et küsimus on, et kas see kass on aneemiline või mitte. What do you think? Teie arvate. No. If we just looked at the hematocrit, you might be tempted to say it was anemic. However, do you remember earlier we talked about the difference between the various parameters and how I encourage you to think of hemoglobin as a somewhat more robust parameter in the face of blood being damaged during collection? Et mõeldes tagasi sellel, millest oli juttu eelmises loegu osas, siis seda hematokriti madalat väärtust peaks hindama selles valguses, et hemoglobiini väärtus on oluliselt vastupidavam igasugustele verd kahjustavatele faktoritele. Ehk et seda peaks interpreteerima selles valguses, et hemoglobiini väärtus on normaalne. It's not surprising, given the cat's excitable nature during collection, that some red blood cells were broken. It pole imestada arvetades seda, et kassid väga erutuvad vered võttes, et mõned punast verelid on tähed kõik. So if there is debate as to whether this cat is anemic or not, let us find a compromise and call it mild anemia. Ehk et kui tekib vaidus, kas see kass on anemiline või mitte, siis kompromissiks võib öelda, et tegu kerge anemia. So if we're going to decide if it's regenerative or not, we should look at reticulocyte concentration. However, I've not given you the reference interval yet for the reticulocyte concentration in a cat. I would typically expect anything greater than 60,000 per microliter to be associated with a regenerative anemia. Järgmisest tuleks vaadata retikulosyüte, et hinnatuks tegu on regeneratiivse või mitte regeneratiivse on eeneva Ja siin selle pildid ei ole kohe olnud juurde referentsväärtust. Kõik, mis ületavad kuute kümme, võiks olla siis viide regeneratiivsele aneemile. Remember, for the reticular sites, the reference interval is very much dependent upon the methodology used. Retikulosüütide üldarvu määramine sõltub, üldarvu referentsväärtus sõltub väga palju 
määrämist ehnikast. So we know that if it is anemic, whether it's anemic or not, we know the bone marrow is busy making new red blood cells, and that makes us think about hemolysis and hemorrhage. Kuna me oleme jõudnud järelus, et ta on anemiline või pisut anemiline ja regenereerib, siis see viimeid mõttele, kas tegu võiks olla hemolüüsiga või perekaatuse. We see here that we have a decreased MCV. Me näeme siis langenud MCV väärtust. Remember, when we see an MCV, we think about such things as particularly iron deficiency, whether that might be causing the production of red blood cells to be undersized. Ja madala MCV väärtusega võiks see ostada näiteks raua puudust, mille tõttu siis rakkuda suurus on vähelda. The RDW is our measure of variety within the red blood cell population. Variety in size. Yeah, RDW values not just this erinema suurus, but also the size of the red blood cells. What do we think to this parameter, the MCH being high? Yeah, which star? Which which star? 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 So again, this is due to hemolysis, that's a calculated parameter, and we've had some breakage of red blood cells. Do you remember our rule of thumb of multiplying the hemoglobin concentration by three? Ja tuleta me meedem ja rusiko reegiteks, siis hemoglobiini väärtus korrutada kolmega peaks on saanud hematokriti väärtuse. 8.5 times 3, we're expecting perhaps 25, 26 percentage points. Ehk siis hemoglobin 8,5 korda 3, et me ootaksime põrgemad väärdust kui see, mis see praegu on, koskend 5 kasvad 6. So we have broken some red blood cells, but the percentage loss is relatively low. Et ilmselt on läinud mõned punased vereliglad katki, kuid sellega kaotsi on punaste vered ei liblade harmaligid suhteliselt maga. And so we question ourselves, will we get a fresh sample? Ja tekib küsimus, et kas me võtame vered uuesti? In this situation, given that the cat was biting, I would not be in a hurry to get a fresh sample. Ja arvestades, et see kass on väga erutunud ja ammustab, siis tõenäoliselt mitte. So one of the difficulties we face in hematology is that we like to use complex words to describe what we see in the results. Mis teeb hematoloogia mõnikord keeruliseks on see, et me eelistame kasutada niisugust komplekseid sõnu see pildi kirjadamiseks. So we say that it is microcytic because the MCV is low. We say we have mild anisocytosis we have an increase in the variety of the red blood cell size. So we must not forget we need to look at the blood film. So let us see if we can successfully look at the blood film. What do you think that is? Sorry, I'll continue to. A red blood cell, very good. And that? The tube. Nucleated root. Somebody said it's not hard to look at a blood film. Remember when we're looking at the blood film, we probably don't have time to spend more than a few minutes. But we do want to look for various abnormalities. Um, and we do want to confirm the percentages that we see on our differential report. Vere äiete vaatamine ei võta palju aega, me näeme ära mõnikad muutused ja me saaksime kinnitada siis analüüsaata või see protsentuaalse jaotus, kas see on liiga või mitte. 
So we suspect from the increase in reticulocytosis that we have a blood loss anemia, considering iron deficiency because of the low MCV. We've looked at our blood film and we've confirmed these percentages are, 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 are reasonable. So we have a high white blood cell count. Does that indicate infection? Not necessarily remember. We have a high monocyte count. When we see monocytosis, we think of necrosis. What is your reaction to this eosinophil concentration? So we are expecting from our typical leukogram patterns, we are expecting in a stress leukogram a low eosinophil concentration. So it is tempting to dismiss this mild eosinophilia as being trivial just due to the reference interval and not pathology. But I think for this patient, were it not to have parasites, it would be there. We've probably seen quite a spectacular move in the eosinophil concentration. When we look at the lymphocytes, remember with the stress leukogram we're expecting to see low lymphocytes. But you'll see with excitement sometimes we see an increase in the lymphocytes. The point that I'm trying to make with these leukogram patterns is a patient, even with a relatively simple situation, such as a, a, a fleece, a free saliva associated hypersensitivity, we can see more than one leukogram pattern at the same time. So you can see that we've gained a lot of information from these numbers, but there are some parameters at the end that we haven't looked at. When I created this slide, we only had a reference interval for the platelet concentration. We didn't have reference intervals for the other platelet parameters. But there's increased interest in looking at the platelet parameters beyond the simple concentration of platelets. We're all familiar with dogs such as the Cavalier King Charles Spaniel that have relatively few platelets. Those platelets tend to be somewhat larger than normal. We should understand that their capacity to bring about primary hemostasis is not just related to the concentration of the platelets. And so today we have increased interest in looking at things such as the PCT. Ja täna praegu me siis vaatame ka muid 
phylogenetics is on or it's a thing with the membrane. PCT is analogous to hematocrit for the for the percentage for red blood cells and for the percentage of blood that is made up of platelets. Selle väärtuse arvutamisel võetakse siis arves hematokriti ja vere hormeelmedi lüüd arvu. Increasingly we're looking to the PCT, the PDW, which is a measure of the variety in the platelet size, rather than just the simple platelet concentration. Ja PDW võtab siis arves vere lihtakult suuruse varieerust. But returning to this patient, what do we think to the clinical significance of a high reported platelet concentration? Usually we cannot associate a high platelet concentration with any particular pathology, but it's usually seen as a side effect, if you will, of the bone marrow that's busy producing new red blood cells. Verelistatute üldarvu tõus ei, ei ole seostatud mingi konkreetse haigusega, kui ta näitab seda, ta on üks osa sellest pildistmisteeklik, kui juhu üki regenereerib, toodab uusi verevõlmeerv arme. So during the break, there were some questions about obtaining blood samples from cats. Uh, Kohvi pausi ajal tulid mõned küsimused, mis puudutavad vereproovi võtmist passida. So who in the room would routinely obtain their blood samples from the jugular vein? Kes siin roomis võtab rutiinselt kasta mille jugular veenist ära? Very good. When I speak in Switzerland or the Netherlands, the percentage is much, much lower. For me, I think it should be our first choice of vein for feline puncture. The only time that I would consider otherwise is if you have the owner assisting you with the blood sample. Ainus kord, kui võiks kasutada muid verevõtu kohti, on siis, kui loomaitab kinni või looma omalik. So I always consider the cat as having five weapons. Kassil on, kassipuud tuleb arvestada, et ta on viis rälva. And so the cat is held under the arm of the nurse or, or, or the other veterinarian. Those two weapons are effectively disabled and the front hand holds the other two legs. Kui abiline hoiab kassi, siis hoidus seda niimoodi kaela alta tegelikult hoiab tagasi neid tagakämpi ja hoiab kinni esikämpi. Ühe käed. There are a variety of other ways to hold the cat. However, if you want to avoid the jugular, my next favourite vein would be the medial saphenous. Et kui on vaja seda jugulaarveeni väitada, siis safeen veen oleks tema järgmine valik. I consider that vein to be far superior to the cephalic vein. Ta peab seda oluliselt paremaks erevõttu kohaks kui cephal vein. When I suggest that to vets, they always, as some people here do, look horrified at the idea. Paljud inimeste jaoks, paljud loomaastel jaoks tundub see hirmus idee. But in my experience, it is a very sizable vein, and it's relatively immobile and easy to, to, to hit. When you use the cephalic vein, it is all too common to sit there waiting some time to acquire the sample. Certainly, if you're using a syringe and you see froth within the chamber of the syringe, that sample will probably be of limited use for hematology. For me, the perfect way to get samples from a feline patient is to use a vacuum system. Parim viis verevõtuks passil on nii vaatkutaine süsteem. 
Now, whenever I suggest that to veterinarians, again, they look horrified at the prospect of using a vacuum container system. But there, they've probably attempted to use the adult human pediatric system on a dog or a cat. So the pediatric system um, is intended for human pediatrics, human children, and the vacuum pressure is lower, and it's a much smaller system, making it much easier to locate it within the vein. Where I, I've used this system in the US, it's a case of placing the needle with the cover into the vein. Then filling whichever tubes you need. Um, and because the vacuum draws just the right volume of blood, there is no difficulty in filling it properly. It's a pleasure to use because you don't have to use a pair of hands to put the lid back onto the box of blood. So I will find all the tubes that I need and I will place an automatic rocker next to the patient. Place the vacuum tainer system within the vein. One tube, two tubes, three tubes, as many as you need. When the tube is full, it's put straight onto the rocker without worrying about the lids. Now, every European vet that I explain this to says, that's too expensive, too difficult to do. However, I would argue, given how much time we spend taking blood samples, if we can make it easier and quicker, we will probably save money. Just remember, do not use the same vacuum tainer system as you would use for horses or cows on dogs and cats because you will be frustrated. If you can't use a vacuum tainer system for reasons of cost, my next preference is to use a syringe and needle. Don't be tempted to take from an intravenous catheter because the samples are almost always compromised. But the least preferred technique is the so-called open technique where you place a needle or a catheter into a vein and then you let the blood drip into the pot. So getting hold of blood samples is not easy, but it's definitely a skill worth, worth mastering. So any questions regarding sampling? She asks if you could somehow combine intravenous catheter and vacutainer. I've never seen a means to combine the two. So what I would like to do for the last half an hour is to spend some time looking at the graphical report as featured on most impedance hematology analyzers. <laughs> Ta tahaks kommenteerida 
hematoloogia vastuseid, mis on saadud impiidensud tehnoloogiat kasutavate aparaatid. My reason for doing so is that I imagine most of you have impedance-based hematology analysis. Not necessarily, but some. Et ta kujutab ette, et teab, et meist nii mõnedki kasutavad impedance-tehnoloogia põhinevad masinad. Essentially, there are really two types of technology that you will find in typical vetri practice. There's the laser-based analyzers and the impedance-based analysis. There's a third category for the so-called vet auto read system, and I think those are, are relatively rare. Ja on olemas ka kolmas süsteem, vett autoriid, aga see on suhteliselt arva kasutud. Ma ei tea, kas Eestis kui oli kasutatud. So from my experience in Estonia, the vast majority of hematology analyzers, practices have them, are in Keelans analyzers. Tema väidab, et enamik Eestis kasutatud analysaatoreid on siis in Keelans tehnoloogia põhinevad. So I would like you to understand a little bit about these graphics so you can get more out of the analyzers. Et ta peab selgitada, kuidas nendest analüsaatoriks nagu rohkem infot kätte saada selgida neid graafikud. So many people have these graphs switched off, but it is important when you go back to your, back to your practices to switch them on so you can learn a little bit more about what the analyzer is trying to say. Paljudel analüsaatoritel see graafiline kujutus on välja ülitatud, aga ta soovitab selle uuesti sisse lüvitada, et saada rohkem infot. So the analyzer will assess the cells simply by size alone. So it will measure the size of whatever is passing through and it will count the number of cells. So these are bigger things, these are smaller and it will have the number on the vertical axis. So here when we're looking at the red blood cells and the platelets, we're expecting to see two hills because we're trying to find two things, the platelets and the red blood cells. And what we hope the analyzer will do is to draw a line between these two hills and it will say anything bigger than this line is a red blood cell and anything smaller is a platelet. Masin tõmbaks nagu joone kahe erineva rakkusuuruse vahele eristades suuremad punastaks verelibledeks ja väiksemad verelistakuteks. That works very well for human samples where you have big red blood cells and small platelets. Inimeste verepool jõutab see hästi, sest punased vereliblad on trahnud süütudes palju suuremad. However, for veterinary patients, we always need to check the graph before believing the numbers. Kuid loomade puhul tuleb seda graafikud alati ennem ülevaadata kontrollida ennem kui me usume need numbreid. So in human samples, we have big red blood cells and small platelets. In feline samples, we have much more variety in the size of the platelets. Kui inimestel punased vereliblad on alati suured ja verelistakud väikesed, siis nendes kassidel on verelistakud suurus väga varieerud. And so here, the analyzer will struggle to know where to place the line. Ja kassi vereanalüüsi puhul masi tegelikult täpselt ei tea, kuhu see piir tõmmata, kust ma talates on punased vereliblad ja millised siis on verelistakud. And it's typically the experience of the impedance analyzer users that they don't trust the platelet count that comes, particularly when working with feline patients. You can see that we've missed a lot of the platelets.